Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to The Audio Analyst. Today, I want to acquaint you with the remarkable performance of the latest cables from Stealth Audio. Stealth Audio was founded by Sergei Timichev more than two decades ago, and I've had the honor and pleasure of calling him a friend since we first met, sharing a cab ride during CES 2002 with another audio friend and colleague, Jim Murad, the man behind the Blueport Jazz label. Stealth is a contrived acronym for Sound Technology Enabling Audibly Lucid Transcomponent Harmony. And Sergey made a huge splash with the introduction of his archetype interconnect, the Indra. Before I move on to the discussion of his current flagship soccer interconnects and USB cables, permit me a brief foray into how Sergey set the audio cable world on its collective ear in the early 2000s. Sergey is brilliant, supremely confident, strongly opinionated, and a generous man. Growing up in the former Soviet Union, he exhibited both a competence at and interest in music. So at six years old, he enrolled in what would be the equivalent of a music conservatory here in the United States. He attended regular weekly classes at this specialized school for serious students who planned to become professional musicians, mostly studying piano and some guitar, until his graduation at the age of 16. He played piano and guitar until he was 22, when the realization that most of his friends either played or sang better than he did hit him. His personal standards drove him, and he is not one to be comfortable unless he excels at what he has chosen to do. He felt it was time to move on. His father had an old tube-based system, which they listened to regularly, and he has said that the audiophile in him emerged somewhere between the ages of 19 and 21. He next pursued a PhD, working on mathematical modeling of certain problems related to electrical and mechanical engineering. But after some nine years in the educational arena, he began to pursue real-life engineering projects, mostly on a contractual basis, rather than choosing to follow the more typical path of pursuing a theoretical teaching career. During this period, though he still spent time with his professionally performing musician friends, it was a time that included his writing a number of technical and even some audio-related articles. He also had the opportunity to work as an engineer in the recording of several albums. He even spent two years studying filmmaking, writing scripts for several comedies, three of which were produced. But his curiosity and fascination with the United States soon got the best of him, and he decided to come and experience the States. Initially working in a variety of computer-related fields for various government agencies in the Washington, D.C. area, he settled in that area and soon decided to make the U.S. his home. His experience as a recording sound engineer and his long interest in audio reproduction as an audiophile soon became a force he could no longer ignore. By 1985, when he first discovered that different cables do sound different, and it became clear to him at that time that commercially offered cables seemed to be less researched and developed than the pieces of equipment they connected, he felt this was an especially likely and easy product category to improve upon. He didn't get too fancy at first, just working to build something better and cheaper than most others were offering. His first interconnects, the fine line reference, were extremely thin, solid core silver wires. By his own admission, they were nothing fancy. Using two extremely thin conductors, barely thicker than a human hair, each with a separate shielding detached from the ground path and hermetically sealed inside some support tubing. The more Sergei poked at the audio cable problem, the more challenges he uncovered. One of the largest had to do with resonance control. He soon discovered that a coaxial cable, or one made of two twisted or parallel conductors, 
has a very pronounced resonance in the RF region. While the RF that everyone talks about is well beyond the range of human hearing, the intermodulation artifacts, the subharmonics of the two more closely related RF frequencies, as emphasized by this resonance, do occur throughout the audible range. To make a less resonant cable, Sergei would develop an advanced geometry and use more than two simple conductors. Sergei's approach to managing electrical resonance is to use varied, complex relationships among the conductors in a cable, avoiding repetitious patterns to minimize resonances, and by having many small ones, not likely to be sympathetic to one another, and which will not amplify. To address the mechanical resonance concerns, he soon discovered that if you underdamp them, you get ringing. If you overdamp them, you get lifelessness. While unable to eliminate mechanical resonances by specifically addressing insulation and jacketing material, he has found a way to manage them. To that end, he employs a different, much more expensive version of Teflon than most other designers. More on that soon enough. By this point, Sergei was converging on all the resources and concepts he had to build his archetype interconnect, what would become the Indra. His ideas had been developing, and one critical material he would need to realize this envisioned product was a certain kind of metal, one that was strong enough to be made into an ultra-thin conductor, but also didn't have the inner grain of crystal boundaries and all the impurities associated with that internal grain structure. Single crystal continuous cast wire was not strong enough or grainless enough. His thoughts went to liquid metal existing in solid form, amorphous wire. Back in 1982, he had published an article in one of the Russian journals about such metals and their properties but it was still impractically expensive to manufacture such amorphous wire. At just about that same time, he was able to find a supply of some existing manufactured amorphous cable. As the Indra concept began to materialize, Sergei laid out nine separate design elements that he felt would be essential to realize his design. They were, one, an amorphous alloy conductor, two, ultra-thin conductors, three, individually insulated strands separated from each other in space by a distance far greater than the wire's diameter, four, his special variable geometry, five, electrical resonance control, six, mechanical resonance control, seven, an excellent, very fast dielectric with excellent charge-discharge characteristics which translate into low energy storage, eight, characteristic impedance manipulation and control, and nine, special termination techniques. The amorphous conductor material he had acquired was about 46 gauge, or about one-third the thickness of a human blonde hair, and one-tenth that in cross-section, extremely strong, and with the ability to carry 100 milliamps of current. Indra would use just nine of these really tiny strands. For insulation, Sergei wanted to use a Teflon that would match the quality of his amorphous conductor material. DuPont owns the Teflon trademark, and they produce several grades of Teflon with an amorphous grade called Teflon AF. The AF grade is embedded with tiny air bubbles and is much softer, and its fast-sounding sonic attributes are due to its ultra-low dielectric constant. But it also fills the bill for his mechanical resonance control properties. The downside is that it's rare, expensive, and fragile. How expensive? Nearly 3,000% more than the most widely used version of Teflon. At that time, the basic Teflon PTFE formulation cost about $7 a pound. The AF variety? $20,000 a pound. All stealth cable products are fashioned by hand and for several very valid reasons. First, the extremely thin nature and fragility of the conductors used throughout his lineup may only be worked with by hand. Further, handmade products cannot help but show the personality of 
the constructor, a result that he takes extraordinary pride in. Finally, there will always be an unavoidable irregularity of patterns when these remarkable cables are fabricated by hand. And in the case of resonance control, Sergei believes such irregular patterns in a cable's construction geometry are a good thing. Given the quality and rarity of the materials used, and the fact that they all must be assembled by hand, like most of today's finest cables, it becomes easy to understand and justify their resultant high costs. When I reviewed the Indra in the mid-2000s, a one-meter single-ended set sold for $5,750. But what a significant product. The way I described its sonic character was that it was the least invasive cable I'd yet encountered to that point in time. It is so invisible, so natural, and so transparent that it challenged my ability to describe it accurately. It was immediately apparent that some overall relaxation had taken place, as everything sounded much less mechanical and effortlessly natural. I suggested that if you were listening to music at a low volume, with an air purifier or a fan running nearby, that mechanical sound generated by the running motor and spinning fan blades, used to move the air by these devices, had become a contiguous part of the music, bonded in with it, blended in with it, becoming an inseparable yet sublimely unsettling and disturbing component of the music itself. Inserting the Indras was like having someone switch off that device, removing a mechanical contaminant previously ignored because it had been so pervasive. It was among the most truly revelatory cables I had encountered since I started caring about the sonic differences I heard in cables in the early 1980s. I truly hope this little history has shown you the innovative and novel approach that Sergei channeled to realize the Indra and the significance of its role in the history of cable design. Now, with this latest generation of cables, first released last year, I'll start with the $1,250 1 meter Stealth USB T Select V3. I installed it between the Ideon Absolute Time Reclocker and the Ideon Absolute Epsilon DAC. Right away, there was much more focus to everything. Pitch definition, most notably below about 60 or 65 hertz, got tighter, faster, and offered more weight and impact. Everything became more defined in its own space and was rendered with noticeably more body and bloom. Honestly, this Ideon suite of digital products from Greece has become my reference because it so closely approximates the character of my twice as costly LP playback front end. But with the Stealth USB-T, things were taken to another level entirely. The T stands for tunable, and refers to the sliding ferromagnetic collar around the cable that allows fine-tuning of its sound. While in play, you move this collar along the cable, and at a certain position, the sound will become more focused, much the same way as you can focus a 35mm camera lens. While it usually takes some time, perhaps several hours of careful listening, the result of finding that magic spot is definitely worth the effort. For interconnects, I have been using the older Stealth Sakura V12 cables for some years now. So next up, I installed a pair of the new $23,350 1.5 meter XLR Sakura V16s between the Ideon Absolute Epsilon DAC and the True Life Audio SSP1 line stage, and a pair of the $17,700 1 meter single ended Sakura V16s between my DSA Phono 3 Phono stage and my TLA SSP1 line stage. Among their other advances, the Sakura V16 represents an improved application of its very cross geometry, affording improved impedance matching between the source and the receiving end, and they feature a more effective dielectric over earlier versions. Wow. The V16 clearly had a more layered, larger, and better defined soundstage, offered considerably better low-end extension, more subjective body, 
and enhanced mid-range transparency. But I was also experiencing a much richer sense of tonal color, broadband. Their unique attribute, one that I first pointed to in my review of the original Sakura V12, is their ability to offer greater transparency and more body at once. My experience with most cables over time, increasing transparency comes at the expense of bloom and body and vice versa. The Sakuras have no difficulty presenting a wealth of both. Such a superb interconnect. Now, I have to admit that I was more than merely reluctant to install the new Sakura V17 Special Edition. My reluctance came from its elevated cost and how good I anticipated that it should sound. I wouldn't want to take it out after I'd heard it. You see, the V17 Special Edition is a limited edition, offering everything available in the V16, but using selected components, double runs of very cross amorphous wire and helium, and as such, only a handful will ever be made, making it the first limited edition in Stealth's history. The 1.5 meter V17 XLR cable I installed between my phono stage and line stage sells for just over $35,000. But the resultant sonic change was not exactly subtle, with the V17 revealing even more of the kinds of enhancements I denoted with the V16s. Notably, more clearly presented staging cues and image sizes, along with that overall enhanced sense of resolution. But they also presented with a more dramatic and wider-ranging dynamic expressiveness, both in their ability to express robust contrasts and to convey scale, and especially in the micro-realm, articulating subtle shadings and nuances. In a way, it was not unlike moving from a pair of uncoated 10 by 50 binocular lenses to a set of 20 by 60 binoculars whose lenses are fully treated against reflectivity and glare. Now, more than 20 years after I first heard the game-changing Indra Interconnects, Sergei's work at Stealth continues to impress and inspire me as he further advances the state of the art in connectivity with his beautifully executed and remarkably faithful musical cable creations. Thank you, Sergei. I cannot wait to see where you take us next. As always, thanks for taking the time to drop by today. Further information on supporting the channel may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers. <laughs>